We're going to do things a little bit differently this morning. For those of you who have been uh, to our services before, we do normally have a more straightforward Bible reading and preach. Uh, But today, as we sit between two series, we thought we'd give space to try something that we haven't tried, at least since I've been here before, uh, looking particularly at the topic of sexuality and inclusion. I think it's probably fair to say that questions around sexuality and inclusion are some of, if not the most challenging, the church is facing at the moment. And we don't need to look very far uh, to see many churches, and indeed whole denominations of churches, finding this a very difficult topic to talk about in a way that feels healthy, that feels scriptural, um, and that doesn't lead to division. And on the one hand, you could say, well, in that case, we shouldn't talk about it. But I guess what I feel aware of is as much as it is a challenging topic, it is also, I think, a really important one. Perhaps most obviously, it's important for people who experience uh, what we might call minority sexual attraction, so people who experience attraction that um, isn't heterosexual. Um, But also, I think for the church, lots of people are feeling this as a very important question. And I would say I've been part of Christ the Rock for about four and a half years, and I don't think I've ever been asked my views on fasting or prayer or communion, or some worship, but not regularly, but at least with some frequency, I have been asked what I think about this. Uh, And so what we're going to do, we shared this at a whole church meeting last year, uh, is over this next year, try and open up some space to start talking about this. Uh, Lots of our home groups, I know, have done the Living in Love and Faith course designed by the Church of England that we tapped into. We've also set up a working group who will be approaching other churches to find ways that they've taken steps with this that have been helpful. Uh, But today we are going to hear from two people as they share their experiences in this area. We're going to hear from Sean. We're very, very happy to have Sean with us here. Uh, Sean is the principal of Trinity College in Bristol, our local Anglican training college. And we're going to have Sue Adset, who I know is a good friend to lots of us here um, and member of Christ the Rock for many years. Just some quick points before we hear from them both. We are going to be talking particularly about same-sex attraction today. So I know that when we bring up the topic of LGBT+, there's all kinds of things it touches upon, but this morning we are going to be particularly focusing on that aspect of it. It's worth saying, Sean and Sue will be presenting different views. So if you find yourself very much in agreement with one, it is likely you might feel a little bit more challenged by the other. Um, We're going to be interviewing them separately. So we'll start with Sean, and then I'll interview Sue for about 15, 20 minutes each. We won't be taking questions from the church, so I'll be asking the questions to them. But they have both said, if you would like to ask a particular question yourself afterwards, then do go and speak to them at the end of the service. Um, I think it's really good that Sean and Sue have been happy to come and share with us. And I think it's quite brave. It's one thing for me to come up here and talk about the Bible and all that kind of thing. But actually, I think there is something particularly brave about sharing from your own lived experience and how that has affected you. Um, And so I would ask that we, between us, try and be uh, as gracious as we can as they share with us um, what they've come to share. 
And just to say as well, the aim of this morning is less to make any big grand theological pronouncements and more to try and open up a conversation that we can start to have going forwards. So um, I'm going to pray and then we'll hear from, from Sean first. So I was, I was reminded of Jesus's, some of his final words to his disciples in John 17, where he prayed to his father that we, his people, may be one, brought into complete unity with each other. And Lord, I know for me, this feels like almost something that could cause the opposite of that. But Lord, I, I pray and we pray this morning that you would help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear well, Lord. And may you help us to see what it means to, to love one another as you have loved us. And to live in unity as you call us to. And I just pray particularly, Lord, for Sue and for Sean as they share. That you would help us, help them to speak well, to speak what uh, they've brought today, but also help us to listen well, Lord. In your name, amen. Amen. So, sh the, sh Sean, sh Sue, share. That's a lot of S's, isn't it? As an ex-English teacher, what's that an example of? Anyone? Well, it is alliteration. Sibilance. Very good. Very good. Alliterative S. Anyway, not sure why I'm saying that. We are going to be sat down, by the way. So um, maybe as Sean comes up in a moment, you might want to just check that you're sat in a place where you can see. Otherwise, I think I'd probably get um, tired in my legs. So why don't we just give Sean a quick uh, welcome? <laughs> Nice to have the applause before I say anything, just in case you don't want to applaud afterwards. So thank you for that. Very good. So Sean, thank you. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Us. It's lovely to come out and about and get out of um, out of the city, as you said. And uh, obviously, it's very um, it's a very pretty drive over uh, over to Yate, isn't it? So that was very enjoyable, it's, especially in the sunshine this morning. Good. So uh, yeah, thanks for having sunshine. <laughs> Sometimes, anyway. <laughs> uh, why, why don't you tell us a bit about yourself, Sean? Just kind of introduce yourself. What brought you sure. to the area? That kind of thing. Oh, okay, yeah. So, um, I'm I, my name's Sean. As uh, Matt said, I teach theology, and particularly I teach ethics in a in a theological college, a Bible college, Trinity College in Bristol. Any of you have heard of Trinity or come across it? Some of you, quite a few of you, have over the over time. Perhaps um, we do we do different courses. So do look us up if you ever want to study some some theology. We have um, uh, scholarships actually, where, whereby people can do it for free. Um, so that's us. And um, but my kind of the reason I guess you've asked me to speak here today is that I, um, for me, the topic of sexuality is very much a personal part of my story. So I became a Christian when I was about sixteen years old, um, and fairly soon after that, I realised I was gay. So for me, um, I'm, and I'm married to a woman now. So as you can see, there's been quite a journey in my life uh, with with that um and uh yeah do you want me to, do why, why don't you tell us talking about myself i'm very good at talking about myself why, why don't you tell us like. a bit about your journey yeah sure and then how that's impacted yeah, your beliefs okay well i was i i was going to i was going to a, a church um uh where i'd become a christian which is actually a youth church and um, we we were very radical. We met on Friday evenings and we had disco lights and, you know, kind of dry eye. Don't judge me. It was the 90s. So, you know, that was that was very cool at that point. And um, and it, because it was a church for young people, they had clear kind of teaching. They realized we can't duck the topic of sex. We need to talk about it. And so that was kind of good for, I, I, you know, I, I really respected that. And they, so their teaching was um, sex is good. It's a good gift from God, but it's for marriage and therefore you should wait for marriage. 
So now if I was grading that now, now that I'm, you know, teach theology for a living, I would give them kind of two marks out of three. Cause I think se- that's why I, I do believe sex is a good gift for, from God that it's for marriage this was obviously years before equal marriage or same-sex marriage. So when we said marriage, we just meant lifelong union of a woman and a man. Um, you know, and and therefore the but then the, but the wrong part I think is just saying therefore wait for marriage because of course you know uh, I I mean maybe for a group of young people um, you know the, maybe the slightly naive assumption is well everyone's going to get married sooner or later. So when it comes to kind of en- engaging with your sexual feelings, you just need to keep a lid on them, kind of thing, and wait until you get married. Now of course you, we all know you will all know in this room there's all kinds of life stories and situations which don't fit that pattern aren't there for lots of reasons so you know some people of course don't marry um, lots of people in our society today get married and then um, the marriage breaks down doesn't it you know these aren't things that we that are shameful they're very normal and typical thankfully you know back in the in the past there was a lot more stigma and, and negative kind of associations with those kind of life circumstances hopefully well maybe sometimes there still is today but hopefully much less than there than there used to be but it meant for me I kind of thought well I'm not I'm not going to get married because I don't I'm not interested in women and I you know I I'd realized I was gay because my kind of male friends it was that time when they were kind of getting interested very interested in girls you know and they were talking they would talk about that guy have you seen that girl she's very attractive or whatever language probably slightly more you know down to earth language they used or whatever um and uh, and I realized that I I there was one guy in particular I thought I think I feel towards him what he's talking about towards about girls you know I'm just not attracted to to girls I seem to be attracted to guys so that was I uh, maybe I'm a bit slow on the uptake but I realized that. so I'm actually gay okay fine so I guess for me over time that, that I sort of thought well then if I'm not going to get married and sex is for marriage that means I won't be in a in a in a in a relationship i'll i'll be i'll remain single and then i did start to kind of read about and hear about other christians you know who had lived single lives and lived very kind of fruitful and kind of fulfilling um, lives as single people so it didn't seem like a terrible thing for me and um, maybe i'd have you know, obviously I've, I've said I'm married now, but maybe if I'd remained single, maybe I'd have found that quite difficult after a while. I don't know, because I don't know what that would have been like in the end. Although, of course, you know, what, if you if you get if you get married because you think singleness is hard, you soon discover, of course, that marriage is hard as well, don't you? So it, it, when we talk about sexuality, marriage, singleness, sorry, this is just, I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent, but it can be quite easy to think that the grass is greener on the other side, isn't it? Uh, Whereas actually, if we do have the kind of environment, which I think is probably why you're doing this, trying to get these kinds of conversations going, Matt, if we have the kind of conversation environment where we can have conversations quite honestly about the different challenges that we all face in our relationships and our circumstances. So for example, as a single person experiencing loneliness sometimes, it never occurred to me until after I got married that married people can experience loneliness as well. It just, you know, seemed obvious to me at the time, oh, well, marriage is the solution to loneliness. Of course, that was naive. I was quite young at the time anyway. So that was that, was that little bit of the journey. Now, off I went to university and at school in those days I certainly wouldn't have told anyone about my sexuality um again this is one of the ways in which I think things are more positive in our culture now than they were because I do remember one guy that had said he was gay and he experienced huge kind of verbal abuse and bullying because of his uh, his sexuality so school was definitely not a safe environment at, in those days in the 90s to be out um, but when I went off to university I then did uh, start telling people that I was gay and uh, and in that environment I I experienced like very much a loving, accepting 
kind of uh, approach to, to being gay, both in terms of the kind of the secular kind of culture around me, most of the ordinary people around me, but also in the church that I belong to. So I was part of a part of a church which was kind of a bit like this one, kind of you know, charismatic evangelical, you might call that, where the vicar knew I was gay. I was church England vicar. Um, I was part of the Christian Union uh, in in the university. Now, if you some of you will have been in in Christian unions in different environments, different universities or colleges, you if you have been, you probably know that Christian unions are not normally kind of hotbeds of radical liberal theology. Would that be fair to say? Would that be an understatement? Some of you, I can see some nods for some people. You know, similar. Mine was the same. Pretty conservative group of people you know but in that environment they knew I was gay but I experienced complete love and acceptance nobody thought that that was a bad thing about me nobody tried to cast it out of me or anything abusive like that they just loved me unconditionally and I think that is so you know that's so important and what that has taught me and I guess one of the reasons I'm happy to come and speak you said oh it can be quite costly to come and talk about this stuff. For me, actually, I haven't found it costly. There have been times it has been hard, but on the whole, the reason I think I want to do this kind of thing and talk from my own journey is to give people that kind of encouragement and message um, that uh, that the church can actually be welcoming and accepting of LGBT plus people, you know, because that's what I've experienced. Not all, of course, not all churches have got it right, but I know it is is possible because that was what I what I experienced. Um, just very simple things sometimes. Like I remember one guy who was a church leader. He had a quite a posh voice, so I'm just going to impersonate. He said, "Sean," he said, "I want to affirm you." You know, just he said it like that. And I, isn't it funny how all these years I, I can remember him saying that still. And do you know what? I, I felt affirmed. You know, he said, I affirm you. Yeah, I thought, yeah, I feel affirmed by that. You know, he knew and he wanted, he, what he particularly was affirming me was that you're gay and a Christian. I want to affirm you in that. You know, that's not sinful. It's not shameful. You haven't done anything wrong to, you know, to, to be in this. Just some people are gay. You know, that's just life, isn't it? bisexual and, and and so on so i felt affirmed and accepted in that in that environment and encouraged um the um and and the reason the other reason i say that is because if you um uh, i mean i read the guardian if you just if you just read the guardian like me you would think that whenever a gay person comes into church they're always going to experience rejection you know, kind of criticism and, and so on, or, you know, that that's often the stereotype of the church and sexuality. And and it's not, I don't wish to minimise when people have had that experience, it's really damaging and, and terrible, but I'm just saying it doesn't have to be that way. It is possible to love and accept people just as they are, I was loved as I was. So that's the first thing people said encouraging things. And the other way that I felt genuinely loved as I was was I got involved in things. There was never a barrier to me. I was on the worship, in the worship group. Um, it was fun seeing you involved in that this morning. So, yeah, I was in the worship group. I wasn't very good. So they were very, they were very inclusive to let me be on the worship group, to be honest. I was part of the prayer ministry team, you know, in the Christian Union. I ended up on the leadership team and so on. Um, and so it's things like that, that it's, you know, what makes you really feel like you belong to a church or belong to a group of, of people is not just that you come along and people smile at you and, and know your name or whatever, although those things are important. It's actually when you're involved, you feel really part of things. So for me, those, those things are all really important. That's really helpful. Thank you. So I, I guess if I was going to summarize your view on marriage, I would say that uh, the traditional view is the one that you would hold. Yeah. A uh, traditional view, I, just to say any terminology is always difficult, but by traditional, I mean the view that marriage is for one man and one woman together. I guess one challenge someone might feel towards that view is it feels quite unfair. So if you're heterosexual, you are you have the opportunity, obviously it doesn't always happen for everyone, but you have the opportunity to get married 
Whereas if you experience same-sex attraction, that is less accessible. Uh, I just wondered if you could give us what your answer yeah. to that would be. Yeah, and I think it's helpful, Matt, that you've named the fact that the language isn't very... Um, it's hard to know the right language because if you say something, well, that's the traditional view, then it instantly makes it sound like, well, that's the, you know, uh, kind of stuck in your ways, you know, don't want to kind of engage and move with the times. Whereas, of course, you know, I'm, I'm well aware of different perspectives. You know, when I was at university, I was studying theology, so I had a lot of free time. And, uh, <laughs> and I, you know, I went to, I thought, I really need to know what I, you know, I've, I've been told sex is for marriage and marriage is between a woman and a man is that right you know so I went to the library and I got out like and I read like as many books as I could find to with you know of the different perspectives on this so there's like okay so if I go along with one set of books one argument I could enter into a long-term you know not promiscuous or anything like that of course but like a long-term faithful loving same-sex relationship I could find a partner or even a husband you know um you know and, and that could be a sexual relationship but but kind of more importantly it would be a you know a loving and and supportive one that's what that's the most important thing um so you know like obviously my desire to be convinced by those books and those arguments was very high and then here's this other set of books and arguments kind of the traditional ones if you like that were saying you know no no we, you know sex is for a marriage and marriage is between a woman and a man that stuff's kind of pretty kind of um firmly grounded in the bible you know kind of so we can't really wiggle out of this that's what these books are arguing and and as i read them i just thought Do you know i really think that's right i don't think i can i can wiggle out of uh, out of that um, uh, I'm not saying that's the only because we'll obviously hear from Sue and, and, and of course others who obviously they don't see it as a case of wiggling out but uh, of genuinely being persuaded that there's a different view but that's how it felt anyway from my experience um, so did that feel unfair In, there were definitely times when it felt unfair um, I think it's really important though to say that um, following Jesus is going to feel difficult for all of us at some point or or other. You know, being a being a follower of Jesus is as as you'll all know, I'm sure, is about taking up our cross. And so everyone who follows Jesus is it will will be called to some kind of sacrifice or challenge. And I'm sure lots of you in your in this room will be able to relate to that and think, oh yeah, for me that's maybe more about this thing or maybe about that thing. If if you're sitting here and you're thinking, I don't think I've ever had to sacrifice anything to follow Jesus, then you that's actually that's on you. You're the you know you need to think about kind of what why not as it as it were. But Jesus calls us all to take up our our cross. So for me, I just felt like well, this is this is the cross for me. This is the challenge for me. Um, you know, what's more important to me? Is it following Jesus or is it having a committed kind of you know relationship, having a having a partner uh, and so on? So so it, that in a way didn't really feel that that unfair. And I think the other thing I'd I'd want to say is because we are in a culture which um, says that. Um, you know, some people are gay, some people are straight, and and if if you if you match that up with the so-called traditional view, and basically what you what you're saying then is, or what what certainly what gay people often hear is, if you're gay, you're not eligible for marriage, you can't get married, and therefore that does feel unfair. You know, particularly if we idolise marriage a bit, because quite I'm not saying it's the case here, but quite a lot of churches, in my experience idolize marriage and make it sound like if you're going to be following Jesus you get a kind of marriage is the way to do that really you know get married to a lovely other Christian person have some lovely other Christian children and they all live happily ever after and of course we know life ain't that simple for lots of people for in all kinds of ways whether it's people who don't get married whether it's people who get married and struggle with fertility whether it's people whose marriages break up there's all kinds of different, you know, um, ways that we don't, you know, that 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 sort of seemingly neat and tidy script doesn't doesn't really work. So I think it's really important that we, um, partly in this fairness, and we move away from that sense of there's a neat and tidy script that that fits everyone. And one of the ways that that I found it too neat and tidy was actually this idea of well, if you're gay, you can't get married to someone of the opposite sex. It, I ended up it's a long story which we probably 
don't really have time for it. If we're going to hear from Sue, but over over time, actually, felt God challenging me about my assumption that I would remain single, and I ended up, you know, totally to my surprise, um, f- developing feelings for a woman, and for, for and she liked me as well, and we ended up getting getting married. So, like that was a way when I was deviating. I'd started by deviating from the churchy script about everyone gets married. I ended up deviating from the kind of the cultural script which says if you're gay you can't get married to someone of the opposite uh, the opposite sex so that that's 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 unusual doesn't mean by the way and i think it's just important i'll end with this it doesn't mean i think that everyone who's gay and a christian should get married to someone of the opposite sex amongst my friends who are gay and uh, and christian I am in very much in the minority. Most of them have remained single and seek to live a fulfilled and kind of, you know, God, God-centered and a flourishing life as a single person. And that's great too. So it's not in any way to say that singleness, to, to put down singleness, it's just that God happened to lead me in, me in a different direction. Thanks. That's really good. Thank you, Sean. Uh, should we give him a round of applause? So thank Thanks you. so much. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Phew. Sue, why don't you come up? Uh, Sue, I'm aware lots of people uh, sat here will know you very well, but some might not know you as well. So why don't you just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about you. Um, So I've lived in Yates about over 30 years, been at Christ the Rock um, until last year-ish for about 30 years, um, been very involved in all sorts of areas of church life, brought up... um, we brought up our two children here, um, and the oldest, uh, my, my husband, died a few years ago, um, and I had a massive amount of support from you all, which was great. Um, and then, just to bring you up to date, Lizzie, the oldest, is now living in Bristol um, in a shared house. Can you hear me all right? It sounds very strange from here. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and then I've got my youngest, Arlo, at, at home with me still, Arlo 26. And um, the reason I've been asked to speak is because of my journey with all this, which has culminated with Ar- Arlo coming out a f- couple of years ago as gay and then um, non-binary as well and changing their name to Arlo. So that's where we are with, with that. And... Um, I think, is that enough of an introduction? Well, I think it would be lovely for you to share with us a bit more about your journey. Yeah. And how that impacted your own beliefs on this topic. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, I think this probably goes back, um, my journey with this, about 35 years when Bill and I were in Cambridge and we uh, got to know a young woman um, who was suicidal and then wanting to go through a sex change. And so in terms of LGBT+, plus, that was our first part of the journey, really. And just ending up thinking there's nothing we, we want to do other than just support. We can't judge why they need to feel the need for a sex change. And we just ended up walking alongside. And some of you will know Mick, who came to visit us every year, a little bit of a handful. Um, and you were all great with him. <laughs> um, and so that was my first sort of sense of, I just, if I meet someone who's struggling with this sort of thing, I just want to get alongside them and um, support. And then 25 years ago or so, you might, some of you remember Mike Holroyd, who was a very good, partially sighted, as it happened, musician um, here, part of the church. And then he went off to Trinity College to do um, training. And at that point, he ended up doing quite a lot of soul searching about his sexuality. And I remember trips across there um, to share with him and talk with him. And he went off and I think he ended up in a church as a curate somewhere. And then he met a man who he um, formed a relation, loving relationship with, has been his partner. Um, they, might, they might be married now, I'm not sure. Um, but basically, at that point, he, he was thinking, I'm, I certainly, there was, a, there was a point when he thought, I couldn't come back to Christ the Rock and be accepted as, I mean, I, I agree with um, my experience of churches 
and Christ the Rock would be, oh, somebody who was gay, I would hope there would be no problem at all with them being welcomed and loved. Um, but if you're in a relationship um, that's and you're not celibate, then that's a bit of a different matter in terms of being able to be fully involved in church life and affirmed and accepted for that. So Mike felt um, that's unlikely to be able to use his giftings and be um, part of ministry. And so he ended up in the gay church um, in Bath, which has, had existed for a long time and was pastor there for about 10 years. And I thought at the time, this is 25 years ago, my, my thoughts were, I'm so glad that church exists for people like him because I don't, and I agree with him, he wouldn't be able to be completely um, himself and using his gifts and walking uh, as part of a community with God um, at our church. And so um, he was he was there and I was just glad that it existed. And I've thought that since as well, because over about 20 years in my job, um, I work in the civil service, I'm an inspector with health, in health and safety. I've had a lot of um, colleagues who are, are gay um, and are in same-sex relationships, some of them married, some of them with children. And I've just thought, I can't invite them here because... Um, I can't expect them to turn into celibate gay people when they're married already or they've got children already. Um, and so I just thought, I'm glad. I'm glad there are other churches which are more inclusive where they can go and be themselves. Um, so then coming more up to date in terms of, oh, and all of that time, I should say this, this is quite important, all of that time, although that's what my heart felt and that's what my opinions were, I also could not see a way around the Bible verses that speak against active homosexuality. And so my belief was really the traditional view still. And at times I was on the eldership here and I thought, oh dear, it is a problem, isn't it? You can't square it. I don't know what to do about it. Um, and then I guess a change in my belief came when uh, next generation down in my life um, were more, uh, it was more relevant to them. And in particular, um, a friend of Lizzie's called Kez. Oh, I should say as well, all the people I'm naming by names today have said they're happy for me too. Um, but Kez shared quite a lot of life with us on holidays and things. And it was partly because she was, there was a bit of a rift for a couple of years with her parents. So she came out as lesbian and was in a relationship. And her parents, who were Christian and uh, church leaders elsewhere in the country um, thought, oh, no, they, they just ended up not being able to feel they could accept her. Um, and she felt uh, rather cast adrift. And, um, and then um, her father, who was a pastor, as I said, he thought, I've got to do something about this. I've got to take a first step to reconcile myself with her. And he started um, quite a lot of reading, reading around the subject for himself. And she told me about a book that he found particularly helpful, which I've got here just to wave at you, called The Possibility of Difference, A Biblical Affirmation of Inclusivity by Marcus Green, who's a gay Anglican vicar, if I've remembered that right. Um, and so he... So Kez's father sort of made a first move and, and ended up uh, reconciling with her and changing his views about what is right and wrong and how important these things are to God and, and what is, you know, that it might be different for different people in terms of, um, and accepting her, basically. So now her parents have got a good relationship with her and her partner. Um, and so it was... Then, fairly soon after that, that Arlo came out as gay. And I have to say, one of my overriding emotions was of gratefulness to God for the journey I'd been on, because I felt, OK, well, I've accepted and I've gone like this to other people. And it's my own, my own daughter now. OK, right, <laughs> just get on with it. Um, and I felt I'd been prepared by God for that, so... So I read the book, I got the book, 
Um, and then we actually read it at home group and talked about it. And I read a couple of other things, um, some stuff online, Steve Chalk and Vicky Beeching's autobiography. Vicky Beeching, the name might be familiar. She was a worship leader at Spring Harvest, got rather chucked out when she came out as gay and said, I'm not necessarily going to stay celibate. Um, and she did the same thing as Sean. She was a the theological student at Oxford, went to the library, read, read lots of things, far more than I've ever read, but she came to a different conclusion. Um, and like many things, evangelical Christians, we, you know, most of us aren't theologians, most of us, um, but we're aware that there are theologians out there who think different things about all sorts of things. And it's hard to know what to think sometimes, isn't it? But the the crux of this book is that it would be great. He, he, he's proposing that there are different ways of interpreting those Bible passages. And that was the key thing. That was the key thing for me that to, to read different views on why those Bible passages, for instance, Paul in Romans wrote them to that particular society, which was very sexualized in, in Rome and it, and making the case that actually it was all about exploitative and powerful and abusive homosexual relationships and other issues of exploitation rather than trying to address, not even it, that they weren't even trying to address a loving, monogamous um, relationship. Because it is about love, not sex. That's the primary thing. As you say, it's love and support that people get from their relationships. So... Really, that, that book helped me think, ah, I can start squaring it now. There is an alternative way of looking at these Bible passages. Um, so that's really, is that enough? Uh, that's really now? helpful. Yeah. So um, I, I asked Sean a more challenging question, so I'll ask you one as well. Um, so I guess one of the challenges people might pose to the view that you're supporting, which you might uh, describe as an affirming view. So to affirm marriage as not being just for one man, one woman, but between people of the same gender. Uh, I guess one of the challenges for that would be that that is quite a specific view held by a relatively small number of churches today, which if we went back in time, 200 years would be much less prevalent. Similarly, if we traveled a thousand miles, might be much less held. And so I, I guess there's, there's a question there, I think, of how, how can you hold a view that seems out of step with, I guess, broadly the majority of the church from 2000 years ago through to today? Mm. How would you answer that? Well, I've, I, I hope that was as challenging as the one I asked Sean, <laughs> in case you think I'm biased here. Yeah, fair, it's a fair, fair, fair question, for sure. Um, I, I've obviously thought about it, and really, I think, I think where it comes down to, in my, in my view, is that what's important to God is the whole Bible story of love and his main commandments to us about uh, to love him, to love each other. And I think over the centuries in different societies, that means different things at different times in different groups. Um, and there are cases where the church's view on something has changed. For instance, the church in this country used to <coughs> use the Bible as a reason to say slavery was a good thing, and then it changed. And it's not, it's not long ago that um, people would hold bits of the Bible and say women can't talk in church and shouldn't be church leaders, and then that changed. Um, and there are masses of other bits in the Bible which we choose not to apply as they were applied. I think um, probably, I mean, Jesus didn't address homosexuality. He did address divorce. He said anyone who's been, who divorces their spouse and then gets married again, commits adultery. And actually, I'm glad to say, I don't think I've, I would expect that to be 
sort of a big thing in churches now in terms of if, if you had a new couple come into the church, would they be allowed to be minister, in a ministry position? Maybe in some churches that would still be a problem, but, but, but there are many things. I think it's all about love. And I, I felt um, when I've gone to more inclusive things like Open Table, which is a group in Bristol of LGBT plus um, youngsters mainly, but who um, run a lovely church service to support each other. Um, I, I, I think the most important thing is, is, is that really, is love. That in, in my heart, I sort of, it sort of leaps when I've been in that sort of environment in recent, in the last couple of years. And I've just thought, for me, that feels the same sort of leap of spirit like I've felt over the years and other times when I've thought this is, this is God's heart for these people. So that's, that's my, my journey, my experience. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And, and just to close, so I'm aware there will be people here, obviously, who uh, very much support what you're saying. But there will also be some who feel quite negatively about it. And I guess without getting into the details of, you know, the theological questions around this, I guess from a kind of more pastoral heart view, what would you want to say to them? I, I would I would encourage people to um, get to a point where they can say there could be brothers and sisters who are followers of God together who hold a different view on the matter. Um, I, I read a lovely quote from, I think it was Billy Graham who said it, um, it's God's job to judge, the Holy Spirit's job to convict, and our job to love. And I think um, being more accepting of how we, cho- how we feel we should be loving, including people from the LGBT plus community and how they feel they can be loving is, is a really good thing to do. And if, and if anybody wants to ask me about the material I've looked at that has helped me change my mind, um, I can, I can um, point you in that direction. <laughs> Thank you. Should we give Sue a round of applause? Thank you. So, as I said at the start, um, that very much was not meant to be making any clear theological statements. Uh, it's worth saying, uh, if any of you would like to, I'm very happy to speak to people personally about my own views on this. Uh, similarly, I know that Sean and Sue would be happy to take any questions you have afterwards if you'd like to approach them. So let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for, for Sean and for Sue. And we, we prayed earlier, Father, that we want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. And so we ask, for us as a church, you would help us to see and to pray and to seek for that to happen in this area, Lord. May we not avoid the hard questions, but may we seek to show your love and your grace and your truth. And Lord, even though We know these things are hard to hold in tension. We pray that you would enable us to seek to love each other and to live in unity with one another as you enable us to, Lord. And Father, we commit this morning to you and all that has been shared. And we ask that what we need to take with us, it would stick. And what is perhaps less helpful to us, we'd be able to drop. So we commit this to your wonderful name, Lord. Amen.